meeting to order. It is uh, 835. Good morning, everybody. Great to see you guys. And um, Commissioner Butler, will you uh, open some prayer? I will. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Heavenly Father, you gather us here today as a people to do your will. Remind us, Lord, that we are here to serve others, to serve the, the Texans with the least amount of power, those that come before us frightened and afraid. Um, Lord, let us be mindful to their needs. Lord, we thank you for gathering these employees together, the, the employees of the best agency, we believe, in the state of Texas, and we will ask for your hand <coughs> to guide them in their daily work, to protect them as they come to and from work. Lord, we, we thank you for gathering these board members together from all around the state to come here and do your will. We ask, we ask for your blessings, we ask for your protection, and we thank you for all that you've given us. We take so much for granted, Lord. Let us on this day at least acknowledge that and to say thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Uh, roll call. Yes. Vice Chair Tom Butler. Here. Dr. Ray Callis. Dr. Gary Wesson. Here. Commissioner Helen Callier. Commissioner Nora Castaneda. Here. Commissioner Lori Hyde. Chairman Rick Figueroa. Here. We have a quorum. Okay, uh, thank you. The commissioner and audience, please be aware that there are microphones in the room that are very sensitive and they can pick up whispers and side conversations. Uh, so make sure your cell phones are turned off as well, if you don't mind. And uh, we're going to start with item C, commissioners, on the agenda, which is public comment. I'm going to read this once. I think all public commenters are present, correct? Yes, sir. I'm going to read this once to make sure everybody so I don't have to read this again because I do love the sound of my voice, but not that much. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> We're taking comments in person day. If you're here and want to make a comment, please fill out a public comment form and give it to our executive <laughs> assistant. And you'll receive, uh, we received five forms, five, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you for being here. Please say your name when you're, when you, when you re and who you represent. You have three minutes to speak. Please understand the commissioners are allowed to ask questions or engage in discussion with you about anything that's not specifically on our agenda. Please also understand the commissioners cannot hear any information about a pending complaint or enforcement in case because we may be ultimately the decision makers in that case. So I want to make sure everybody's got that. Okay. All right. So uh, we're going to start off with uh, Rinda Songer, right? Okay, Ms. Songer. Yes, ma'am. Go, go right, right in there. Right there. Just state your name. Thank you for being here, first of all. <coughs> and state your name and, and who you represent. Okay. And where the, Christine's going to keep time. Okay. My name is Rinda Songer, and I'm director of the nonprofit Fact Education. Um, we umbrella Texas Cosmetology Educators and the Texas Cosmetology Association. So our educator group numbers over a thousand in the state of Texas. I've provided you with a document that's got some citations and references because there's too many things to talk about in three minutes. Um, and I wanted to make sure you had something to look at. During the, um, I'm here to talk about agenda items M and N, the amendments for cosmetology and barbering. During the August 19th Barbering and Cosmetology Advisory Board meeting, when, when it's the, the proposed rules were presented for the first time to the advisory um, board, important and key information was missing or misrepresented. The TDLR General Counsel presented the proposed <laughs> rules explaining that some changes, such as the required sign, quote, is something that will be implemented with a lot of outreach and education, and continued to say, because this is such a large rule package, Maybe the largest one we've ever done, instead of sharing the rule text on the screen, I'm going to share a summary of what the rules actually do. She summarized the rule changes for the board. You're, you'll see a screenshot and a link to the time mark segment of the video. Based on the recording of the meeting and the manner in which the proposed rules were presented as a summary, it appears that the advisory board was not presented with enough knowledge to vote or recommend proposed rules. It did not appear that the advisory board members had a copy of the full set of lengthy rules prior to their vote. Council moved on to explain the bill also removes the general education requirements. That's a quote. Not referring to the hours required, but instead referring to the previous requirement that a barber <laughs> licensee has a seventh grade education and a cosmetology licensee has a high school diploma, GED, or is successful on the ability to benefit test. She explained again that both of these, quote, have been removed from the statute. This is incorrect. <coughs> the general education requirement has not been removed from the statute. The statements shared with them were absolutely incorrect. The new law states that requirements established by the commission may include requirements regarding an applicant's minimum age, education level, and the completed hours of instruction. 
Um, so I believe that the advisory board voted at that time on the proposed rules being provided with incorrect information from general counsel and unfortunately it's documented via video. I mean, that's what they said. So I want to say more. Time's not going to allow it. There's many other items that are, there's discrepancies existing and it's really been about the process, procedures and methods in which the information has been shared over two years. We're two years later, still don't feel like we have a sound set of rules that our industry deserves and they just don't make sense. The new curriculum requirements are really out of alignment. Um, I'm respectfully asking that the commission not consider the proposed rules today. They need a thorough review and reconsideration before consideration for a vote. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Any Appreciate questions? It. No, we can't do that. But All, right. <clears throat> All right, uh, Kimberly Hill. <laughs> Uh, my name is Kimberly Hill and I also represent Texas Cosmetology. Um, I am a high school cosmetology instructor and I would ask that the board please reconsider adding back the high school information for the high school diploma on the education level for both barbering and cosmetology. Um, the facts that are in place show us that the pass rate is lower in barbering than it is in high school and there is no requirement on the education on the other side. They just had to be 16. And so the, to me, it's very important <coughs> that the education side be added back in there because let's face it, we don't want to go somewhere and go to a doctor that's not educated. Well, we feel like we're doctors in our field and we're the professionals and we're educating people to go out and do what we're doing. So that's, that's an important piece that needs to be added back in. Um, the distance learning, um, when they, they voted to make a change to make it to 50% on the theory hours to be put into place when we were at 25, 25%. I didn't think that that was even possible to consider making that change at that time. Um, but what's the regulation behind that? Who's to say that someone's going to go and do 500 hours? How do I know it's not someone's sibling that's online? There's nothing that shows the parameters for when those people are doing their theory learning online, who's actually getting that time. So I encourage you to please stay with the 25% <coughs> on that because at least there's less room for error to see who's doing that work. Um, COVID really did a number on us. I don't know how many of you have been into a salon recently to go have a service done, but how many of those licensees that are there now have ever stepped foot in a salon in a school to actually perform services. They got all of their hours online never having been in a department. The other thing, sitting back watching some of the meetings and talking about the signage that goes into place that's being required for us to have school student practitioners, I had to watch and re-watch and look back and measure and I I grabbed a yardstick and I'm thinking a yardstick and then I literally sat and measured. Do y'all realize that the signage that's being asked to be placed in my school is two of these tables long, two of these tables wide for that to fit? I'm in a high school program and a 10 inch block letter. I mean, that's a piece of paper per letter. It's ridiculous. We're asking that you can consider maybe placing the signage on the website just like they did for the human trafficking. There's a sign for us to print off. I'm asking you to please reconsider that. It's, it's a burden on some of the schools, whether it's private or public. We don't have the space. Time, You're going. Time is up. Okay, go, 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 go ahead. Finish your thought. Yes, that comment Thank is you, there's, no, there's nowhere for us to put that sign and it's a burden in a high school. You're going into a school to receive a service. Really? You don't know that it's a student? So even a sign this size should be acceptable at the door when they're walking in showing that it's a school. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, Kim Ridley Myers, right? That was you? Okay, I'm sorry. I'm Kimberly Hill, sorry. Okay, Kimberly Myers. Right. Okay, okay, there you go. I want to make sure there's two Kims. All right, go ahead, ma'am. 
Okay. Um, I'm Kimberly Moyers, and I'm representing myself, but I come with experience of being a subject matter expert for PSI, for MPS through Milady, writing test questions, and I've been founders of college programs, currently a founder of a high school program. I'm also an operator and a salon owner. And uh, I can cover her with what Renda Songer had said about these rules, but I want to point out a few things of, to um, bring to your attention. One of the biggest things is the distant education that was talked about on 1013 or 1031 advisory board. Uh, in the proposed rule, there was the only change was the two verbiage of Cosmo and Barber being added together. And during that meeting, because some public comment said we want more online, uh, then they chose to just change it from 25 percent online to 50 percent. So cosmetology, that'd be 500 hours of your thousand could be theoretically online. And if you look at the major companies that have online programs, and I've looked at their timeline stamp, and they don't even have but maybe 400 hours online if you did every single activity. So this is your major textbook in the industry, but we're going to allow 500 hours for a cosmetology program, which I think is excessive. And then also it's going to leave room for, like they said, you're going to have people just manipulating the hours and, you know, I could go to a school and enroll in 500 hours and get them online and then go to another school and then, well, they didn't take it, but as soon as they get the first 500 hours, then they have their license. So we don't know the validity of what they have going out into the, you know, work in the industry, and that could be a safety concern um, on if they're going to have the skill to actually work safely uh, in the community. And um, also, um, I think there's no parameters on distant education. If you're in a classroom, you have a 25 to 1 ratio, but there's no rules or anything that state that you have to have 25 to 1 on an online setting. So I, me as a school, I could go and enroll 1,000 students in one class with one teacher and give them 500 hours online, and then now you have no, not much oversight. And then what is that going to do to the industry, to educators' jobs, the quality that the student is getting in that learning? So I just think that that opens up a door for a lot of fraudulent hours, a lot of cheating, and I think that definitely doesn't need to be approved. And I think it needs to be looked at with more convincing data on is that really what the industry needs. So I'm asking you to please do not approve that, and if you feel like it needs to increase maybe to 30 percent would be an okay thing, but I think it definitely needs to be revisited uh, and do not vote on that today. Um, also, with the general education requirements, I believe that they should ha have a high school diploma. And if you just look at the statistics, the pass <coughs> rate from Barber to cause, the cause is always higher. And um, go ahead, go ahead, finish that. I would like for you to reconsider um, that and try to elevate our industry and promote more education instead of minimizing it and saying, okay, you don't have to have any education to come take a test that's a 10th and 11th grade written level if I don't have an education or even a seventh grade education. And I think that's why the pass rate is so low, because there's no, not the education requirement. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Moyers. Moyers. Got it. I apologize. I get it. Um, Joe <coughs> Arrington. Good morning. I'm Joe Arrington. I'm representing McClendon Community College in Waco, Texas. As proposed, tax, TAC 83200 does not include any reference to minimum educational standards. The Sunset Commission staff report of 2020 notes that barbers currently have to have at least a seventh grade education, and cosmetologists must have to have at least a high school education or its equivalent. The proposed rule wipes out both of these standards. We oppose this dismissal and propose that the verbiage of 83200 be revised to include the following. First. Keep the higher standard of high school graduation or HSE equivalent in place for newly licensed people beginning September 1st of 2023. Second, allow currently licensed people to renew using the legacy standards for each of their license types. And finally, that the higher educational requirement be phased in for barbering over one or two additional renewal cycles that would be three to five years. In an email sent to the commissioners, I outlined four supporting arguments here. For the sake of time, I'll call attention to just two of them. 
The lack of a designated educational level will have a detrimental effect on those in the practice of cosmetology and barbering. During the October 31st meeting of the Combined Advisory Committee, data was presented that summarized the examination results for September and October. The data show that of about 1,100 individuals who took the cosmetology written exam, 595, or about 51% passed. Compare that to 500 who took the Class A barbering exam with less than 200 or 40% passing. In November 14th summit meeting, it was reported that barber and cosmetology exams were written out of the same source textbooks, my lady, and pivot point. In emails, publishers of those books reported that the my lady text is written at somewhere between the 10th and 11th grade level, and pivot point is somewhere between 9 and 11. Since the PSI exams are based on these tests, it is reasonable to be reduced, regardless of modifications, that the tests are also written to the level of somewhere between 9th and 11th grade. Requiring no minimal education standards for written license exams creates a mismatch that will worsen test performance over time and put underprepared students at a disservice because they have invested time, effort, and money with no return on that investment. Secondly, the Sunset Commission in its report does not advocate nor does it recommend abolishing pre-licensing educational standards. Instead, it calls for harmonizing the different requirements. While holding true to the spirit of harmonization, a rule addressing the education requirements can be enacted that creates both a foundational new educational standard while honoring the legacy. In conclusion, we advocate that the verbiage for 80, 83, 200 affirm a minimum educational standard of high school equivalency. We believe this requirement is not prohibited by law or by the Sunset Commission report, and we submit that this requirement can be implemented over time while honoring those who came into the profession under the legacy rules. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your time. Appreciate it. Uh, Mary Lindsay. <coughs> Good morning. My name is Mary Lindsay, and I am representing the uh, Community College Cosmetology Educators of Texas, in which our membership are approximately 50 cosmetology educators from community colleges. Uh, I would like to um, thank the commission first for coming and representing uh, TDLR at our meetings that we've had at the summit. We were very excited that the commission took the time to come and, and listen to what we were um, uh, putting forth and what and really our avenue to where we were going the roads to travel and that means a lot to us that you were concerned and uh, considerate to the the new rulings uh, I concur with our other testimonies today I would like to, you for the Commission to look <coughs> into the education requirements I think it's very important that we have an education requirement I know sunset uh, is asked to blend barber and cosmetology boards and the rulings and uh, well, first the law and then to the rulings so we do see a need for education requirements to be considered and um, to harmonize uh, and we also would like to say uh, we are charged with uh, educating our students to guard the health safety and welfare of the public and how can they do that with they can't read directions and uh, it will provide a barrier to the written exams and you've already heard the pass fail rate so written exams a student needs to be able to re read and uh, to work in industry also want to hit the topic of um, uh, the online education distance education I feel the 50 percent is too high a thousand hours would you please reconsider to lower that back to the 25 percent um, we did go through COVID online at the community colleges and saw our student success drop and we would like to ask to please reconsider that uh, online learning and the ratio from student to instructor be held if that's going to be the deciding factor but also uh, 500 hours of the thousand hours is way over the limit of we teach 90 percent of our students are hands-on learners and uh, I know that you can do some hands-on online because we had to do that during COVID, but it was very compromised learning. So we ask that you reconsider and, and look into those rulings before that's passed. 
Uh, again, I want to thank the commission for having us today and listening and uh, for your support at our summits and uh, across the state. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is that it? Yes. Okay. Ladies, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for your time. Uh, commissioners can't engage on that. We will have this item up, but we appreciate you taking time. I know you're busy, and as we all are, but thank you for taking your time and giving us your input. It's critical. I can tell you it's heard, being heard. So uh, I do need a motion, commissioners, about the uh, absence, excused absence of the other commissioners. Uh, Mr. Chair, I make a motion that we uh, excuse the absence of uh, Commissioner Callis, of uh, Commissioner Collier, um, Commissioner Hine, and Commissioner Hine. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, we, commissioners, we are going to skip executive session unless you have a need to go into executive session. Brad doesn't have anything, so we're good? Okay. So we're going to go on. Uh, also, I take a motion <coughs> to accept electronic signatures. So moved. I'll second that. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. I think I got the house cleaning done on that one. Uh, we're going to go to uh, item F, which is uh, Tony Kovalon. Sir, how are you? Good, good, good. Uh, good morning, Chairman. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. I'm Tony Kuvion. I'm the Budget Analyst for the agency. Um, you'll recall last session the legislature passed House Bill 1560, which was the agency's sunset bill. And it made many changes to the agency and the program, some of the programs that we regulate. Um, included in the requirements of HB 1560 was uh, the legislature asking us to perform a study on the regulation of auctioneering and prepare a report with any findings and recommendations to improve public safety and the department's processes. Um, I was placed in charge of the team that uh, performed the study and completed the report, and so I'm here to let you know what I found or what we found. <coughs> um, we had uh, first we had our, our legal and, and government relations folks. Uh, look at the regulation of auctioneering in the states that do regulate auctioneering and uh, looked at their laws and rules and processes and, and look for best practices and stuff that maybe we could appropriate for, for our, our uh, regulation of that. Um, we conducted two online surveys that uh, one was a survey of the license holders and one was a survey of the public to uh, get their <laughs> feedback on what they thought of the auctioneering program and uh, any ideas that they might have for that regulation. Um, then finally, uh, staff uh, reviewed our processes uh, internally for auctioneering, and we uh, held a series of meetings with each division to uh, get their thoughts and on you know stuff that would help uh, improve the regulation of auctioneering. Um, um, the, I didn't get the, uh, the report to y'all beforehand it wasn't including the materials I forgot to give it to Christine so the, the report is there and so I know y'all haven't seen it yet uh, but the findings that were uh, came out of the out of, out of the study are they start on page 14 uh, of what could be done to improve auctioneering and 15 was the actual recommendations that we came up with some were internal processes and some are uh, recommendations for uh, changes to statute and rule. Mr. Chair. Yes. We're just getting this report. Should Tony have to deliver his report as an auctioneer would? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm having enough trouble right now, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Good luck, Tony. <laughs> Um, I didn't know if y'all wanted to, me to go over the, the recommendations. Uh, they're on page 15. Why don't you uh, go through them quickly? Oh, sure, sure. Um, they include in reviewing and improving the educational examination materials and procedures, uh, improving the enforcement <coughs> processes, uh, improving our communications and instructional materials on the website to uh, help applicants and reduce the need for uh, our what we call request for information. It's, it's follow-up when uh, applications aren't complete. Uh, we want to move to an online process for applications so that, that folks can do that online instead of by paper. And uh, we want to 
improve uh, or develop an, edu an outreach and educational processes to uh, better inform the public of their rights and provide information on TDLR's role in regulating the industry. Um, the recommendations for laws and rules was to update the standards of practice and pr improve the uh, education and auctioneering recovery fund. I'm sorry, auctioneering education and recovery fund. Uh, enhance enforcement processes and their authority and clarify the requirements for the associate auctioneers. <clears throat> uh, we presented this the, the report draft to a work group, the advisory board on November 14th. They had some questions. They gave us some recommendations to help improve the, the study. Uh, we then gave or presented the uh, study to or the report to the full auctioneering board on November 29th. Um, they had some questions, uh, had some comments, discussed it, and they were good with the report. They, they liked what we had done. Okay. Our plan now is to uh, send it to the two committees that have authority over us, which is uh, licensing and administ administrative procedures in the House, uh, business and commerce in the Senate, and uh, we'll have that to them by January 1st, as we were required to. Um, so we don't need y'all to do an approval on this or, or you know vote on it or anything like that uh, we just want to let you know that the report's complete as we were required to do and uh, I can answer any questions that y'all have Excellent. thank you John any questions commissioners all right okay appreciate it thank you all right Tony. thanks so much thank you Tony um, we got item G of electronic signatures already moved uh, commissioners you've seen the minutes a motion or any comments about the minutes? Sure, I make a motion that we accept the minutes. There's a second. Yeah. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, motion carries. Uh, we're going to move to contested cases. We have one, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Jessica, good to see you. Uh, I don't think we need to read. There's nobody here, right? And Jessica, you've heard my voice more times than you want to, right? So we're going to, you go ahead and have the floor. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Jessica Hurtado, and I'm a prosecutor in the Enforcement Division. The ALJ <coughs> excuse me, recommends that you deny David Keith Fansler's application to renew both his journeyman and master electrician licenses and revoke those licenses based on his criminal history. I ask that you adopt the PFD as written. Respondent's criminal history dates back to the early 1980s. In 1982 and 1984, Respondent was convicted of two misdemeanor offenses, assault and criminal mischief. In 2004, the department issued respondent both a journeyman and master electrician license. Subsequently, in 2014, Mr. P Fansler was placed on a deferred adjudication for two more misdemeanor offenses, violation of a protective order and criminal trespass. In 2017, Mr. Fansler was convicted of a second criminal trespass offense. In 2018, the department opened enforcement cases against respondent to investigate his criminal history. Those cases were closed and the department allowed Mr. Fansler to retain his licenses. Respondent again renewed his license <coughs> in 2019 and days later, he was convicted of misdemeanor terroristic threat and sentenced to 24 days in jail. In 2020, the department again took a chance on Mr. Fansler and renewed his licenses despite his criminal history. Then, in 2022, the respondent was placed on deferred adjudication community supervision for two years after pleading guilty to two counts of felony aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. The victims were roommates living in, at the residence with the respondent, and one of the victims told police that she left the residence that day because she was concerned with the way the respondent was behaving. When she returned, she found that the door to her room had been kicked in, and the victim locked the doors and when the respondent returned to the home, he began to yell loudly that he was going to slit everyone's throats and stab them. The respondent then entered the residence through a window. Respondent called the police dispatch and threatened to shoot anyone that came to his door. When the police arrived, respondent was present at the scene and in, pos in possession of a kitchen knife. When questioned by officers, respondent stated that he had <coughs> the knife because the his roommate had threatened his dog. When asked what he planned to do with the knife, respondent replied that he would do, quote, whatever it takes. 
Respondent is scheduled to remain on supervision until February 2024. In analyzing the Chapter 53 factors, the ALJ notes that the respondent was 56 years old at the time the two felony offenses occurred, and the offenses occurred less than two years ago. During the hearing, hearing, the respondent testified that he has two sons, that he attends church, and is in compliance with the terms of his supervision. However, he submitted no other evidence of his fitness for licensure. The ALJ concluded that the evidence supports a finding that the respondent may pose a risk to the public and have opportunities to repeat his conduct if he is allowed to retain his licenses. The ALJ recommends that you deny respondent's applications to renew his journeyman and master electrician licenses and revoke those licenses. I ask that you adopt the PFD as written and I'm available to answer your questions. Thank, Thank you. you. Any questions? Take a motion. PMD. Second. All, right. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Jessica, thank you. Good thank job. You. All right. Commissioners, we are going to item J, which is the rules. Uh, Stephen Leary. Leary, good to see you. Good morning, Commissioners. Stephen Leary, Assistant General Counsel. Item J relates to the proposed rule amendments affecting the continuing education requirements for the orthotist and prosthetist program. The proposed amendment will amend Title 16, Texas Administrative Code, Section 114.50, Subsection I, in order to allow for licensees to claim one hour of continuing education credit per renewal period for completing the human trafficking training that was mandated by Health and Safety Code, Chapter 116, under House Bill 2059, passed by the legislature in 2019. Additionally, the rule amendment will allow for one hour of continuing education credit for completing the jurisprudence exam on renewal. The proposed rule was published in the Texas Register on September 16, 2022, and the public comment period expired on October 17th. No comments on the proposed rule were received. The Orthotist and Prosthetist Advisory Board met on October 24th and recommended adoption of the proposed rule without changes. I recommend that the Commission vote today to adopt the proposed rule with an effective date of January 15th, 2023. <coughs> available to answer any questions. Commissioners, any questions? All right, I'll take a motion. Mr. Chair, I make a motion that we adopt the proposed rules regarding Chapter 114.5 to the ortho, orthotist and prosthetist program. Okay, as of January 15, 2023, right? January 15, 2023. Right there. Is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Mr. Carries, thank you, Mr. Leary. Thank you, sir. Good job. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Ms. Pella. Item K. <coughs> Hello. Hello. Sorry. Sorry. Good morning. Hello. Good morning, Commissioners. I'm Wendy Pello, Senior Assistant General Counsel. Um, agenda Item K. Um, these are the proposed changes to our Chapter 60 rules, the <coughs> procedural rules for the uh, Commission of the Department. You see we've made, um, excuse me, uh, multiple changes to... You need a minute? <laughs> Sorry. You okay? No, I'm okay. Um, sure you some water? I'm okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, multiple subchapters and sections um, in the procedural rules. Um, these changes are coming from um, changes suggested by staff, strategic planning, the four-year rule review, and uh, uh, the department sunset, excuse me, department sunset bill, House Bill 1560. Um, the changes are making um, a variety of substantive and cleanup changes. This is um, part of a uh, larger effort of updating the Chapter 60 rules. Um, so this is kind of the first, oh, thank you, part of the first uh, group of changes that you'll be coming, you'll seeing in um, uh, future rulemakings. Um, just in terms of some highlights, it's a large package, so we've tried to make some uh, cleanup changes in terms of the applicability um, of the rules, in terms of it applies to all of our programs. Um, there's also been some 
um, updating in terms of the powers and responsibilities of the commissioners and, and the executive director in the department. Um, of note for the commission meetings, um, there's been some updates in just in terms of the electronic signatures that's built into the rules. So um, in the future, uh, that wouldn't need to be um, part of your agenda item that just be built into the, into the rules. Also some clarifications and updates about uh, public comments during the commission meeting. And then just updating and reflecting your current um, powers and procedures, uh, powers and responsibilities in terms of um, issuing sanctions um, as well um, as clarifying the executive director's duties under uh, state of disasters declared by the governor's office. Um, under September C, we've got some uh, new rule. It's actually relocated provisions, um, trying to separate the license revocation provisions, separating it from those who have a license revocation so that are based on, not based on criminal history versus those in criminal history. So those provisions that were currently under subchapter D with um, the criminal history have been moved into subchapter C with other license provisions. So it makes that distinction. Um, so hopefully be more user friendly for the, the person who's looking for, for information about their license revocations. Subchapter D, we've kind of, it's mostly reorganization um, in terms of these are the provisions of dealing with um, folks who have criminal histories, whether it be a conviction, deferred adjudication. Um, of note, we've kind of grouped the, um, the provisions together about um, persons who are incarcerated to make that easier to review. Um, persons, there is an exception now for um, student permits for barbering and cosmetology for persons who are incarcerated in, in school in the Wyndham School District. Um, that way they can um, accumulate hours to pay get credit while they're incarcerated, but that permit's not allowed to be used outside of a licensed school setting. Um, and then also of note with the House Bill 1560 is removing that honesty, trust rate, or integrity provision. That was a sunset recommendation and that was removed from our statute and so the rules have been updated to um, reflect that as well. <laughs> Under fees, we've got a lot of clarification about program fees, adopting um, the, by reference, the Attorney General's rules about um, costs for copies of public information, and then clarifications about license renewal and late renewal fees. Um, under subsector G, some cleanup about rulemaking and negotiated rulemaking. Most notably is the ad additional information about the rulemaking petition information, what needs to be submitted, um, reasons that could be denied, um, how the department will handle those um, petitions, and then um, new subchapter L, which is department personnel, and those are required rules and they're required by statute. So we have new rules related <coughs> to um, the department personnel, uh, uh, training and education, and then also the department sick leave. And so, like I said, these are the first group of um, future of uh, chapter six real changes that will be given to you. Um, these changes were published in the Texas Register on September 30th, 2022, and we only received two public comments during that comment period that uh, closed on October 31st. Uh, we didn't make any changes uh, based on the public comments. The department does have uh, one change to rule uh, 60.102, the petition for adoption rules, and that's just a technical um, change to change the website address or the online form or where those petitions may be filed. And so the department is recommending to the commission that you adopt the chapter 60 rules uh, with the change to 60.102 with an effective date of January 1st, 2023. Thank you, Wendy. Any more questions? Mr. Kerr, if I may, uh, Wendy, the electronic signature, uh, could you expand uh, on that just a little bit? You, you said that uh, it's gonna be in the commission meeting. Uh, well, just kind of briefly, what's what's changing there? Um, on your agendas, you always have that agenda item for right. approving the use of the department to use your electronic signatures. That has been built into the commission meeting rules now. And so now there's a provision, let me see if I'm specifically saying um, that the department may use the, we don't have to do you don't have to vote every time. It's oh, just okay. built in that okay. you've, you've delegated that authority to the department. Um, and so that we can, uh, let's see, I'm going to try to make sure. We maybe approve it one time and for. Right, right. right. and there's still the um, the right unless, unless notified of the right. So if you want to, um, <coughs> you know, say we, oh yeah, the department staff may use the commissioner's electronic signatures on written orders or decisions of actions taken during the commission meeting unless otherwise directed. So if there's something that you, during the you wouldn't want, you can direct that as well. So that's gonna kind of build in, hopefully streamline your meeting agenda. 
Right. You, you can get us out of here faster. Is that your goal? <laughs> no. Thank you, Wendy. Good answer, by the way. Um, <laughs> any other questions? Any questions? All right, I'll take a motion. Uh, I make a motion that we adopt the, the proposed changes as uh, handed on by Ms. Powell. Mm -hmm. what, was, what was the date again? Uh, January 1st, 2023. Effective January 1st, Okay, we got a second. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, motion carries. Thank you. All right, I'm going to take a five minute recess, if you don't mind. It's 9 15. I just need to circle back on some things. So, uh, commissioners, we'll be back here at 9 20, okay?
the meeting back to order. It's 929. Uh, we're going to be on item L. Thank you. Uh, I'm Derek Burkhalter, an assistant general counsel for TDOR. Uh, today I'm presenting agenda items L, M, and N, which all relate to the consolidation of the barbering and cosmetology programs. Uh, because the three agenda items tie into each other and have overlapping public comments, I think it may be best to present them together for a single vote covering all three of those items. That would end. be exactly perfect. Okay. Okay. Uh, quickly, before I get into the substance, I just want to acknowledge that, that this rulemaking effort is just a piece of a much larger effort by an excellent team of department staff who have been working hard behind the scenes on every little detail of this transition and have made every effort to help licensees understand how the changes affect them. Uh, we held summits in McAllen, Dallas, Houston, and Austin, which some of you attended. Uh, we al we've also updated our website with innovative tools to target information towards particular licensees. Um, so that team is here today in the back. Um, I may have to defer to them at certain points if there's something that's beyond my knowledge, um, but and they're certainly available to you if you have any questions along the way. So uh, having said that, diving into the substance, uh, so as you know, before our sunset bill, barbering and cosmetology were each separately administered programs with separate statutes and rules, separate licensing stru structures and requirements, and separate advisory boards. Uh, the recent sunset review of TDLR identified an administrative overlap between those two programs, and so House Bill 1560, our sunset bill, combined the programs into one under Chapter 1603 of the Occupations Code. Uh, under the new licensing structure, the Class A barber license and the cosmetology operator licenses will still remain unchanged and still have their unique features, but the specialty licenses, establishment licenses, and school licenses will no longer distinguish between barbering and cosmetology, and their requirements will instead be standardized based on the type of service being provided or taught. <coughs> uh, so the development of these rules uh, followed our standard process. The initial draft was developed with the assistance of work group members of the, the advisory board. So this would be the health and safety work group and the education and, and examination work group. So that was where our first draft came out of with their advice. Uh, the advisory board met and they were presented with the initial draft at its August 19th meeting and it recommended publication in the Texas Register. That occurred on September 23rd and then the public <coughs> comment period closed on October 24th. We received about 70 comments, and these were all presented to the, the advisory board at its October 31st meeting, which you've heard about. Uh, the advisory board at that meeting recommended adoption of the proposed rules with several changes that I will explain along the way. Um, so first, regarding agenda item L, this is kind of the easy one. This just updates chapter 59, which is our continuing education uh, provider chapter. Um, so the rules for that chapter would just update the list of occupations that are subject to Chapter 59 uh, to add barbers who will be subject to continuing education along with cosmetologists beginning in September 2025. Um, but it also removes polygraph examiners, which were deregulated by House Bill 1560, and also removes booting operators, which were deregulated back in 2017. Kind of booting, like toe booting operators, oh. like when you get your car booted. Oh. Uh, so these changes were not presented to the advisory board because they're broader, it's a, it's a more department-wide chapter, um, and we only received seven comments on, on that particular chapter, but none of them were really on point or really of merit. Um, so we're, we're recommending adoption of Chapter 59 with no changes. Uh, for Agenda Item M, so this is our chapter dedicated to barbers currently. Um, so the proposed rules would repeal from Chapter 82 all the provisions for barbers that will no longer be necessary because we're going to streamline them in Chapter 83 with cosmetologists. Um, so we will only leave in place for Chapter 82 the rules that are necessary for the transition period to provide the licensing and fees and curriculum structure for the transition period until September 1st, 2023, when the full transition is completed. Um, we, uh, let's see, the department is only recommending one small change to, to this Chapter 82 set, and this is just to remove a reference to booth rental permits, which were also repealed by HB 1560. So just one minor correction on uh, the Chapter 82. 
And then agenda item N is the big one, and that's the chapter 83 rules. Again, we're consolidating everything into chapter 83 for both barbers and cosmetologists. Um, so the rules, they would streamline and update the health and safety standards and licensee responsibilities, and those will, will all take effect January 1st. Uh, they also provide the new curriculum standards for approval of barber and cosmetology courses, and those new curriculum standards will take place on August 1st in time to give schools time to, de to design their curriculum. Yes, ma'am. So this is what they are opposing? Uh, there are elements. I'm just saying, let, let me finish it. I'm, we're going to highlight everything, but yeah. There are, August, 20, August 1st, 2023. Is when the curriculum changes Correct. take Correct. effect. Yeah. And then the licensing and fee changes will take place on September 1st. So there's that month of delay, but again, that's to allow the Correct. school's time. Um, <clears throat> so this also includes transition provisions for cosmetologists to provide the, their licensing for the transition period as well. Uh, so the advisory board did meet and discuss this, and they recommended several changes uh, to the rules. Um, you've heard some of those issues brought up uh, this morning. And uh, I, I will go into each of those changes, but uh, Ch Mr. Chairman, I'll kind of lead, lead to your direction. Um, you know, do you want to address particular issues now? Why don't you go through all the changes and then highlight the education level, the percentage online, and uh, the signage issues. <coughs> uh, time goes, but go through them all. Absolutely. Sure okay, there. okay. Um, so the, we received nine comments the most about the uh, they were opposed to the individual license requirements because they did not include a high school diploma or GED. Um, so this issue was specifically debated by the advisory board at its October 31st meeting, and the members voted against including such a requirement in the recommendation. Um, so currently, cosmetologists are required to have a high school diploma or a GED. Uh, currently, barbers are only required to have a seventh grade education. Um, and keep in mind, these are just licensing standards. These are the schools are free to impose their own age requirements or educational requirements if they see fit. But we had to harmonize those two standards and provide one for for both. And so, um, you know, based on that, the initial draft that came out of the work group and then the, the advisory board recommendation, uh, we did not include that extra requirement in the in the licensing requirements for the high school diploma. Um, so I know that's uh, a big issue that came up today, so uh, I guess I'll open it up for discussion on that issue if you, if you okay. like. Yeah, we'll have to let Commissioner, you have any questions on that? I don't like it. You, what, what level do you have it at right now? Uh, so currently in our draft, there is no educational requirement. You just have to be at Zero. least 17 years of age. Okay. But the schools are free to impose education requirements if they want for, the, for students enrolling in their, in their schools. Okay. So we've kind of given that flexibility back to the schools. But the fact is they can just pass the licensing board without actually practicing. They can pass ex the exam without practicing having hands-on as long as they're... No, this is educational. This is, this is about how much education do you need to take the test. Yeah, just minimum this, this is enough. This is enough. It has, nothing, it has nothing to do okay. with it. It's just, do you have a high school diploma or not? And that's the requirement for one side versus the other. Right, but why, are two, why two standards? Uh, because they were separately administered programs. They had two separate standards. So we're trying to bring them together and have one standard that applies to both. Right, but why would not the two different standards be one? Why is a barber less educated? That was just the way that the laws and rules developed over time, and that was kind of the difference that we had to reconcile. And so rather than have those two separate standards, we're just having one standard for, for both. But it's one standard, but different, <coughs> different uh, educational backgrounds. Is that there, there would not be different standards for barber and cosmetology after these rules. After these rules, what would the standard be? The standard would be you have, you have to be 17 years of age, and there would be no high school education requirement. The cosmetologist and barber? Yes. Correct. Okay. Any questions? Go ahead. Okay, so um, the next issue we received a lot of comments on, uh, there were six commenters from some big organizations, including 
the American Association of Cosmetology Schools, Aveda Arts and Sciences, Milady, which is the textbook designer, uh, and some other organizations. So they opposed the separation of theory hours and practical hours. In our first draft, we said these subjects you have to cover in theory this many <coughs> hours, these subjects you have to cover in practical this many hours. So they didn't like us separating them out like that. They said the schools ought to be able to decide the proper mix of theory and practical and decide how to treat those subjects as they see fit. Um, so the advisory board took in all those all, took in all of those comments and they ultimately agreed and they the advisory board suggested making a change to do away with that differentiation and so all of the all of the topics could be taught through either theory and or practical um, so the department's recommendation incorporates that recommendation we agreed with it and we just take it a little bit further by consolidating the groupings together and then removing duplicative topics so it just cleans it up a little bit um, explain theory, explain the two things. Sure, sure. So theory would be like more like classroom teaching, you know, just instruction, didactic sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And the practical is like the hands-on element of that. Correct. And so in the law, the statute says that you cannot do the practical part through distance education. So that part is completely off the table. But you can do the theory hours through distance education. Okay. Um, and so this would just remove, um, you know, we wouldn't tell them you have to do these subjects through theory and these subjects through practical. We just say you have to cover all these subjects and you decide how to separate it out. Um, okay, but there will be actual practical, uh, practical them actually having hands on? Yes, okay. yes. And so that, that leads into the next topic, which is the limitation on the number of hours that you can do through, dis through distance education. The, the first draft we had out said that you couldn't do more than 25% of the course through distance education. We got a lot of comments from those same heavy hitters, and the advisory board agreed that we should raise that to 50%. So under the current version before you today, a school can designate up to 50% of the course as theory, and that can be delivered online or, or through distance education. Um, so that's just the maximum. You know, they're not required to do that full amount. They can do anything less than that amount or none at all. They can do everything in person if they want. But so the change would be to just raise that from 25% to 50%. And we've agreed with that. And that, that was what the advisory board recommended. So they can states. designate 50% of the, <coughs> the hours is theory. And those can be total online. Correct. Right, which requires basically the, 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 the the total hours would be 50% online, basically. That, that's Potentially, that, that could be the case, right. yes. So then uh, they had a question on how many students can do that per teacher. So is it, did we quantify So the, 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 the ratio is one instructor for 25 students. But that was not put in there? Uh, that so that would have... I'm sorry? That was not stated in that... That standard is in the proposed rules. It's not in the particular section of distance education, but it, it still applies to that section. Okay. Because I heard someone mention, you know, she says that it could be at least 1,000 people, and so the ratio to online learning, you don't have it set in stone. The, so the, the 25 to 1 ratio would apply when there's an, like interactive learning. If, if it's just a, like a video they're playing, then they don't have to have you know those instructors present for each student. But if it's if it involves uh, interactive synchronous uh, learning, then the standard would apply. So you couldn't just have one teacher covering thousands of students. It, it would be one to twenty-five. You understand what he's saying? Uh, somewhat, but then I also see her disagreement. She well, I, I, okay. Okay, let's focus on that's not. That's not if you got a question, Mr. Bull. Uh, so, if they're just doing their homework distance learning, it doesn't matter how many students are on. Correct. But if, if it requires a teacher interaction, the practical So, what, um, so the practical in other words, homework is, you know, whatever they do, they can go through chapters. We don't need the teacher. But when the teacher is actually uh, teaching, we need to make sure the ratio is 1 to 25? Correct. 
and how do we get that monitored? Through our standard, uh, you know, inspections, course approval process. Um, but I mean, it's online, so how do we get that monitored? Um, I mean, that, that may be a challenge, <laughs> but ultimately we, we approve the way the course is designed, and so we know how they're planning to, to execute the course, and if they deviate from that, then that would be an enforcement action that we would take against the regulation to force them. Two different state sanctions, which is very common among other licenses. So, so attendance could still be taken if it was an interactive online. Yes. Just, just the way any, any college or high school class is, attendance can be taken. You, you show up. Yeah, and, and <coughs> some, some teachers want to see your face while you're attending class. I think the, the 500 theory hours, it could be like, what are the laws pertaining to a barbershop? And so um, that would be online distance that anybody could take. That's where, I mean, a thousand people could watch that same video because the law doesn't change from person to person. I think the interactive, there would be a role. <coughs> the practicum, where so they're cutting hair, correct. right. Yeah, you, there has to be somebody on site mm -hmm. watching you monitoring. Mr. Chairman, may I ask that all the commissioners uh, speak into the microphone when you're commenting? Um, in particular, Commissioner Castaneda, the folks online are having difficulty hearing you. Thank you. Go ahead, Doctor. I also just wanted to take a chance to point out that we will be doing a follow-up rulemaking to clean up some of these issues that we don't have worked out perfectly at this time. This is this rulemaking is to kind of just lay the lay the foundation, and we can work on some of the some of the details um, in a cleanup rulemaking afterwards. So we may not have perfect answers to everyone's comments at this point, but we are, we're taking those in, and we will definitely work on those things. Uh, so uh, moving along. Uh, two commenters, including the textbook designer Milady, provided a list of topics that they felt were missing were missing from the topic list for the curriculum items um, for the Class A barber curriculum, the esthetician, and the manicurist. Um, so we agreed. The advisory board and the department agreed with those changes, and we added those subjects in as recommended. Uh, we did also remove some of the duplicative topics um, that were just repeated twice. So the changes were? The changes uh, specifically, I can go into those. They're listed in 83.202. Let me just pull that up on my screen. Uh, so in this decision, I thought uh, had to have a different type of license, uh, like falls under a physician. I'm, I'm sorry. Doesn't anesthetician have to fall under a physician? It depends on what procedure they're doing. So an esthetician license uh, enables them to do certain cosmetology procedures. They can't step out of that and do something like Botox. That would be a medical procedure, and they would need the delegated authority from a physician to do anything like that. And we are working on... Uh, providing some clarity through some, some documents uh, with TILA's team uh, in our strategic communications office. Actually, you can work with Dr. Callis on that one as well. <laughs> uh, so regarding your question about the specific changes, the added topics uh, for the, let's see, the cosmetology operator and class A barber course, uh, they wanted to add skin care and related theory, hair removal, nail care and related theory, Electricity, makeup, pedicuring, and artificial nails. What's electricity? Uh, oh, oh, hair, okay. Uh, additionally, for the esthetician license, uh, we're adding skin diseases and disorders, skin analysis, and makeup. And for the manicurist curriculum, we're adding nail and skin diseases and disorders, artificial nails, <coughs> product chemistry, basic manicuring and pedicuring, nail art, and electric filing. <coughs> so those were the additional topics. If, so with the additional, uh, are they having to now uh, present cosmetology, um, nail techs, etc.? are they going to have to update <laughs> no. Uh, so um, these were just basically 
key, ways to keep the status quo. There were things, <coughs> things that were missing from the status quo that the textbook designer said, hey, you guys left this out. They do this already. So they're, they already do this, correct? Right. Yep. Okay, so. <coughs> Um, we're also recommending changes to simplify the barber cosmetology crossover courses. So these are the courses, if you already hold a Class A barber license, this is the course that would allow you to get the cosmetology operator license, or vice versa. Um, so rather than have the, the topics listed out specifically, we just instead just refer them to the <coughs> corresponding elements within the basic course. So if you want to get the operator license as a barber, you just have to take those 300 specialty hours in the basic course, and you can do that. Um, so that just simplifies that language and makes it consistent with the, the basic course. Um, regarding the, so there's a new license type called hair weaving specialist slash esthetician. It's a combination license. And so we didn't have a curriculum for it before. Um, we, we developed the language through the advisory board work groups. Um, we initially had it as a 700 hour course, but the esthetician curriculum is a 750 hour course. So they said, you know, look, it doesn't make sense that you could get a combination license with less hours than the basic license. And so the advisory board recommended raising the hours for that license from 700 to 900. Um, but the department is actually recommending changing that to 800 because that would be consistent with the other combination license which is the manicurist esthetician license so we just thought you know each combination license should be 800 uh, so that's where we deviate from the advisory board in one aspect uh, and then finally well let's see another change is regarding substantial equivalence licensing um, so this would be people from out of states who are already licensed um, part of our rule would allow them to um, get credit for work history up to 300 hours. Um, there were concerns in the comments that this seemed to allow unlicensed activity in Texas. And so we just added clarifying language to say, no, those work experience hours have to be done in the state where you're licensed. You can't do them in Texas without a license. So that was just a clarifying change. Uh, and then additionally, in section 83.200, we made some cleanup changes to references that were non-substantive, just, just technical corrections. Um, another issue that came up for discussion um, is the new signage requirements for schools. Um, so, so this is not a change for barber schools, but it is for cosmetology schools. They're required to have a sign basically saying uh, school dash dash student practitioners. And in the statute it says it has to be 10 inch block letters or another standard prescribed by the department. <coughs> Excuse me. Now when we say 10 inch block letters, we're not talking 10 inch square letters. It just has to be 10 inches high. So it, it can be much, narrow, much narrower than one might think and not take up quite as much space. But they do have to have this sign in front of every entrance to the school so that each person who's entering the school is aware that you know, a student is gonna be working on you here. Um, so there, there were a lot of complaints about the 10 inch block requirement. Um, we didn't choose to make any changes to that standard in this rulemaking, but it's something we can take a look at later, um, unless the commission chooses to make changes to that standard today, but that was something that did come up. So the 10 inch was, uh, was requested by us? The, so the statute says 10 inches or another standard the department recommends. In, in this current rule set, we just went, went with the 10 inch requirement because that's the current requirement for barber schools. Um, so. so it, um, so, going into a high school, that so isn't that kind of redundant? And it, it does become tricky with high schools, and so they're going to work with their administrators to kind of decide, you know, where is the appropriate place to put this sign, because sometimes it's, you know, just down the hallway or something like that. So there will be some flexibility for, for public schools to work with their administrators on where's the right place to put this sign. Because I would imagine they don't have drop-ins, they have, they would have to have appointment support. So, right. your customer is aware that they're students. Right, and if you're going to a school, it makes sense that you would think that a, that a student will be working on you. Um, but, but yeah, the, there is that issue with the, with the public schools. I would, I, I wonder, do they need to sign a consent form? Perhaps that would be... Well, the, the statute does require a sign of some kind. So, we, I mean, we can't work around the statute. 
-hmm. But you could add a consent form if you wanted. Mm -hmm. We we could look at doing something like that to, just to ensure that everybody knows what's happening. Sure. Mr. Burkholder, uh, since we're on the topic, do you think there's something we could do to make the uh, signage a little more reasonable? Mm -hmm. um, because we the, the, we have that flexibility, right? We do. And I think uh, you do. I think some of the uh, speakers brought up a great point. Something that we could they could print off the commission's own website. That way, they know they're in keeping with the rules. Just please consider that. So um, we, we talked internally about making the standard something more like it has to be legible sure. or, you know, something something to that effect. That's reasonable, yeah. Okay. So is that it? Um, so, yeah, that, that summarizes. Let me just take a look over my notes and make sure I hit everything. Uh, just one more thing. So um, the... Several commenters suggested allowing schools to offer a combined curriculum for Class A barber and cosmetology operators to allow you to get both of those license types. Um, the advisory board recommended that change as well. Um, we agreed with that change, the, de the department, in our recommendation. We just used alternative language um, to say that students can be enrolled simultaneously in both programs. And so this prevents us from having to approve a combination course. We can just say, no, those, those two courses are already approved. You're just simultaneously enrolled. At the end of the day, you can get both of those licenses. Would that uh, incur uh, double tuition or? So the, the, uh, there are 700 hours where the licenses have the same requirements. It's only for that extra 300 where each has specialty hours. So this would allow you to share the 700 for both and then just take each of the specialty and be able to get both licenses. And so that uh, concludes the changes uh, to Chapter 83 rules. Um, ultimately, we're seeking a motion to adopt uh, the rules for Chapters 59 <coughs> and 82 uh, with that one change to 82 and then also adopt 83 with those several changes right. the department recommended. Okay. Thank you. Uh, four commissioners, uh, let me give you an outline. Christina, is there anything you need to add? No, sir, not at this time. Thank you. Okay, okay. So a couple of things, commissioners, you need to One is, uh, as they went through this process, right, it, it, we're catching up with a lot of stuff, right, and the process is not to try to uh, reinvent the wheel, but to understand the advisory, listening to what they have. So there's a lot of comments back and forth. Uh, I love the issues. L and M seem to be straightforward. We can vote on them. N is the one that seems to be the most one we want to talk about. In that respect, we have the authority to modify this. Again, not against the statute, but against the need of it, right? Uh, I also want to remind you that, uh, Mr. Brokhalter said this earlier, that this is going to be a process, right? So we're kind of building the plane kind of thing, right? And so uh, we can mandate that uh, the, they come back to us and see exactly. how this thing comes back again to give us a little more time to, to process this thing. And we even need to be aware there's a lot of grandfathering considerations. As we change these things, people have already vested in a certain process. So um, I just I want you guys to be aware of that. Um, so before no we motion? Start to, no, no, you, you're, we're going to get a motion. I'm just saying that there's ability to talk about each of these issues that you want to talk about. Ask Mr. Bolthalter, Christine, anybody that's here. And then we have the ability to modify these as we see fit, right? And we have the ability to call uh, the, the advisory commission to come back to us with the update and see if there's where, where these things have, you know, have done well and done right now. I think Mr. Bofalter said that we're it's our first swing, swing at it, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. All right, so questions or comments? Just outline. So the, the issues, I'll give you the issues with educational majors, the number of hours, virtual, uh, the, the crossover coursing hours, which is the combined, and, and, and then the out-of-state license was the other one. Did I miss something? And the signage. Correct, and then the uh, the education uh, for licensing purposes. Right. Although although we're not recommending a change in that regard, but that was an issue that, that right. came up. <coughs> Questions? No, I think it's been discussed. You know, I, I think the staff and, and advisory and everybody's input has been well received and, and reviewed. And like you said, we've, we've got to just basically make, make a point. We have our foundation. Changes, mm -hmm. and then we're going to be watching it and, and having reviews as we go along and if we need to make some modifications, that's kind of where we're at on this. Right. 
Again, we have the ability to, yeah, you know, we have the ability to change it. I'm giving you that as clear as possible. Right. Okay, I want to make sure I'm that. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. To, uh, to the industry folks, um, thank you for being here. I, I can't tell you how important it is, it is to us to hear your perspective. Um, and so we want to continue that, okay? Because sometimes we make rules and we don't know what the real world ramifications are sometimes. So we appreciate that. We appreciate our advisory uh, boards as well because they're boots on the ground. They deal with it every day. And so between all of us, I think we'll come up with some good rules. <coughs> just know that this is, like the chairman said, our first swing at the bat. And so this is just a starting point. It's not the ending point. So let's get the ball rolling and, and then let's continue the conversation. And uh, when do these take effect, Mr. Burkhalter, September 1? Uh, so as a whole, January 1st, okay. but certain okay. pieces of it don't take effect until August 1st and September 1st. Happy? Okay, okay, so, all right. Um, Do you have a comment, Norm? No, I was asking them if, you know, as we're still uh, going back and forth, if there's anything that we, you feel that we've missed, perhaps? Yeah, well, I, I, yeah, well, I, 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 mean, no, I don't, the process, we need to work through the process. I mean, Understood. We can't jump the process. And, and it's, it's not, it's, we're so still, much, we're still. Right, right, so we can work, if you want to ask a question, and we can follow up. But the issues that, you can look at any of these issues that were brought up today and, and adjust Correct. Him to if you wanted to signage, I'll just pick one. I'm not seven. You want to say, hey, look, we want to resist the signage. We think we want to reduce to make sure that it's applicable to make sure that whatever you want, we can do that. And we'll also construct the commission, which they worked hard on this, right? So Understood. Okay, to, to go back and revisit, and we can opt this meeting, talk to anybody individually that we want. Oh, I, I, because you said was there any comments and so i was okay. thinking you're good you're good you're good okay sure. from the crowd none no. No. okay mr uh, mr Burkhalter, so uh we're you're asking for or the department's asking for amendments to chapter 59 correct there wasn't a 39 did i mishear that correct just 59 59 correct. Yes. okay chapter 59 um chapter 82 correct yes um chapter 83 Yes. I just want to make sure that I get it all correct. Because I know I'm going to mess it up. So I'm just going to try <laughs> to mess it up as little as possible. Okay. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. Okay. Any other comments? Well, I mean, no. Mr. my comments are such. Let me give you mine. Um, I, I think that uh, we there's a lot of opportunity here to change. I, I think that it's important. I think the education level is, is significant. We need to we need to look at that. And I, I don't know how the other commissioners feel, mm -hmm. but for me, I think that to be able to to read literacy is a key part to be able to do things that could cause hazard to people's health. So that's an important part. Um, that level, but I'm fully aware that that, that there's a lot of uh, sword that cuts both ways when you do these things. But I think we need to be aware that that's we need to visit that, and I expect that to come back to us. Does it make sense? Absolutely. Um, the, the number of hours on virtual versus, I think that uh, um, you know me and how I feel about virtual. Not mm. a fan. You're not a, a fan. fan. Not a fan at all, right? <laughs> I'm a 3D guy, maybe because I'm old, but that's just me. Um, I, I believe that there's an opportunity for us to always evolve with education, right? Because I know I'm not the guy you're educating. You're educating people who do think differently than I do, act different behaviors, whatever. We need to consider that, but I think we'd be very judicious about how much we allow these things to go into place, right? And I think a significant hours at 50 is a lot, so I think we need to really visit what would be <coughs> leveraging opportunities for education to allow people to get their vocational license, which is paramount, to get their vocational license, get people to work, give them an opportunity, not disenfranchise them, but also institute a, a, some sort of level that they feel we feel comfortable that they're ready to prepare to do their job well. Does that make sense? All right. Yes, uh, it does. The signage thing on my issue, I think it's a, uh, it, it, it to me, it, it bureaucracy is not my favorite. Right. I mean, um, I think we need to we need to figure out what, what we can solve to make the burden less burden. Right. And and I think it needs to be aware. I don't think anybody, anybody needs to be disillusioned about whether who they're who's cutting their hair, but we need to be aware of what that is. And but I, I mean, I, uh, within the statute, it is stated, but we need to be aware that let's not grind this. To, to where people are encumbered, encumbered a lot. Um, 
I do, I, and I'm not going to do like the idea of people being able to do barber costs and the leveraging component. I'm a leverage guy. So if the rules, if we can find those two, I think that's a great opportunity. I realize that two different cultures are merging, right? And that's never fun, right? It's just not fun because legacies are hard to unchange. We want to make sure that as commissioners, we allow as much grace as possible to occur as this merger occurs and making sure that people aren't disenfranchised or processes aren't marginalized. And does that make sense? It does. Okay. And so I, I'm, I want that to be the first and paramount. I want to make sure the advisory board is, and I know the, some of the commissioners showed up to some of the conversations. Uh, so there's a lot of people who have opinions who aren't here right now. And so we just want to factor in that at the end game, we want to be better than where we were, right? It might not be perfect, but we'll be better. Does it make sense? So Absolutely. I think all these issues that were brought up were very salient to me. And I think there, there's nothing here that I wouldn't think, okay, that's that's a good point, okay? That's just my personal opinion. Understood. All right. And so um, with that, I think that commissioners, you can, we can, we have three motions that we have to move on L, M, and N. Um, but with your permission also, I would like to uh, make sure the commission is aware that they would like for them to come back to us. Is there a time frame that you guys would like? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to see maybe a year after the program is implemented. Let's give it a year to, to sort itself out. That's two full classes at uh, 1,000 hours. Um, maybe we can revisit and all that. All, we can, and nothing is off the table. Okay. That's just one suggestion. Yeah. Somebody may have a, a, another reason. That's probably good, because I think this is going to take a interaction with enforcement too. I mean, you know, all, all of these changes so that there's not just a blanket, okay, this is all off, off, not supposed to be doing this way and, you know, causes more enforcement actions, which I don't think is what we want to do, you know, to, in your area, what you shared about somebody getting a license and be able to have their vacation. So what I'm understanding is that we're going to go with this plan for a year. To we haven't voted on anything. Some people don't have no, to vote for it. Right, right. But what we're saying right now is to go with this plan for a year to see how it works and not modify it at all. You can modify it. You can bring up any of these modifications that you wish, as long as it's not against statute. I, I think we still need to modify your points. Which one? The, the points right now about the education, the signage, the ones that you just earlier made. Uh, before the school year. Okay. So you want to address it prior. You don't want this delay is okay. Okay. Right. So we got wait a year, wait a year, and you want to address it in trench work. Yeah, time. those particular ones because I think they're the smaller things in life are the ones that uh, I've taught before, and I if you have to add anything else, it's it's very difficult. First dealing with children and then having to deal with instructors, principals, the state, and then to have to add more to your plate, it's very difficult. And so, and then now the schools just don't let anybody come in, so you have all that to factor in, and I would hope that we're not burdening you all with extra, with extra uh, rules and regulations, so maybe we can just try to ease perhaps some of these that would make it a little easier for you all. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. So, first of all, Mr. Burkholder, thank you so much. I know the time that has gone into this, um, and the advisory board members, if you're listening, uh, we appreciate your time and effort. Uh, we're, we're all volunteers in this. We're all trying to do the best we can for the public of Texas, those that are trying to get into the job and workforce, uh, it, with minimal amount of effort as possible because that's where they're coming from. So, you know, let's keep that in mind as we continue this discussion that we're trying to employ as many Texans as we can. We do that as safely as we can. And so I think sometimes when we start talking about requirements and those in educational levels, we need to keep that in mind. We're trying to educate those with an eighth grade education. Uh, we're trying to enable them, empower them, to be able to earn a living somehow. And so how much education do we want for a barber who's just looking for daylight at the end of the day? Uh, or people that are looking for an inexpensive haircut at the end of the day? Uh, how do we let those people meet in a marketplace without being 
overburdensome and overregulatory. So y'all's complaint is that the signage is too big. Somebody's complaint is that there are too many hours to get a job. And so we have to balance all those interests. And so we need to keep that in mind. When we start talking about all these rules and regulations, we're talking about people that are trying to make a living. That's, at the end of the day, this is what it's about. And so how burdensome do we want to make it for them, right? At what point does somebody from a tough situation just say, forget it, I'm just going to go deal drugs? I mean, you know, what, what are we going to do? And they'll come back. They'll come back. Um, so just keep that in mind. Sure. All right. Anything else, Commissioner Buckley? Commissioners? All right. I'll take a motion or any uh, offer of amendment or whatever you guys want, where you want to go. So I'm ready to make a motion if everybody is satisfied that their questions have been answered and they've been heard. So I just want to make sure that everybody feels comfortable because once I make the motion, and if, if it does pass, you know, we'll be back in a year and a half or so okay. uh, to discuss this. If no, I've, I've, I've got that covered, but thank you, yes. Uh, Brad, quick question. So if we do motion, do you set, accept L, M, and N, or do you want us to do three, three different motions? I, Mr. This is Brad Bowman. I, I think it's uh, it's up to you, Mr. Chairman, uh, but you might, if you want to pull out, uh, is it N, Derek, the, that has the more controversial topics if you right. want to pull that one out separately to uh, to vote on depending on you know what you're contemplating in a motion that might be if, if the there's best any, way to go. Okay. All right, Commissioner, so you have it. Um, I'll take a motion or any, any other questions? I'll, I'll make a motion now for L and M, you know, to, uh, to be accepted. Is there a second? I'll second. No. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, Brad, we got motion carried on L and M. Uh, N, item N. No, I think I think what we're and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I I feel like this has been under review and and coming to this point for like over a year or is it a year or two years that we've been looking at this and trying to merge this from when the legislature put all that in. We've had advisory board meetings. People have have. You know the the issues, and and this is still what we're coming at with. I think if we want to look at it instead of a year after we pass this, and maybe make it six months to see if we see any any difference in that, uh, we don't have to we don't have to let something go on forever. Okay. You know, to, to I can agree that. to that. Okay. So I'd make a motion. Do you have a motion? Yeah. Effect. Is there a motion I, out of that? Make that a whole motion to, to on end that we accept and and have it up for review in six months. Okay. I'll second. And can I clarify, Mr. Chairman, uh, in terms of accepting, in terms of the uh, Dr. Weston, your motion, um, that's to accept item in as it was laid out by Derek, Correct. as it's been recommended to you today, right. and then revisit it in, in we'll six months. Revisit back in six yeah. months. Laid out with our uh, recommendations, not laid out as you presently have it. Laid out with the department's recommendations. With the what recommendations do you or you want to offer? The ones that we have been discussing. Yeah, but we haven't. Uh, I, I agree, but there's mm -hmm. no tangible metric on this. In other words, we haven't changed the hours. I think the only option we have is to table this in, you know. And well, and that's that's that that's a whole that the ramifications of that because <laughs> that, that you want to be careful. I know what you're saying, mm -hmm. right? We haven't, uh, as far as the education level, mm -hmm. uh, the signage, we haven't offered any changes to their on this. So you can offer that. Or currently, Mr. Dr. Weston's motion is that we accept it. It's been laid out by there, right? And to be revisited six months, get a lot more time for the advisory commission to take out a lot of these factors that we looked at today. Right. Uh, when we come back with s in six months, we'll look at these. Yes. Correct. Yes. See, maybe get a report. See how it all went. Yeah. Maybe y'all are are guinea pigs. Uh, Bad word. Okay. But, but yeah, but yeah, I got you. I got you. Uh, I, I just want to make sure you, you, to you understand that the two lanes are just distinct. Okay. Okay. One is one is the lane. If you wanted to talk about a substantive change in any of these, we could. Now it's time to do it. The other lane is we're accepting these, but six months from now they'll come back to us with what we've understood and allows us to 
have conversations with them on the technicalities of these issues. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, okay. Any, did I explain that? Is that clear as mud? You did great. All right, I'm good. Good. I can do it in Spanish, too, if you like. <laughs> so, I, all right. I do, I do so, have a, 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 a concern. If I, I got a motion. Mm -hmm. Just a second. Is there a second? Is there a second to the motion? Okay. Uh, motion dies a second. Discuss for a second. Um, I, I don't know that, that the academic institutions, um, my, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but in, in my imagination, uh, will you have your ducks in a row um, in time to review it six months later? I'm, I'm, uh, a gentleman from uh, uh, the community college, Mr. Coburn? Uh, Arrington. 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 Okay, I'm sorry. Um, I mean, is this enough time? If we just give you six months, are you building the plane as we go, so to speak? I mean, is that enough time to evaluate? Any question? Can I respond to that question? No, no, no you don't have the floor, sir. You just you give me a second. Yeah, so that's, that's, a, that's a concern that I have, yeah. yeah. Is, is, I mean, is six months enough time? That's why I thought a year would be two full uh, classes, and then we could kind of refine. Uh, but isn't this, isn't this what you are actually here for? Is against that. You got to direct your questions to the people on the right. That is important. I so, do. So, and, and I can just say, you know, during our summits, we got a full range of questions and comments in every direction. What, what you've heard today is a small subset of much larger group of comments that express many different opinions. So I, I would caution against giving too much weight to the individuals physically present here today, right? Because there are many opposing views from. Yeah that have merit from, right. from organizations, um, people who, you know, should also be considered. Right. So, so, so the question is, Tom, is you, you have issue with the motion of six months, and if you like the motion. I, I'm hoping to amend it for a year. So would you like to amend the motion? I'll amend the motion for a year. So accept the as, as presented. presented with a year, allowance of year time to go through. Okay. Mr. Chairman. You second that motion? Oh, yes, go ahead, Christina. I'm sorry, before you move forward with this discussion of six months or a year, I wanted to seek clarification from Derek. Um, if I understand correctly, the rules that are in front of the commission today are the first but not the only package of rules that we anticipate proposing as part of the sunset implementation. Is that correct? So, so this, this would lay the basic foundation and we would do a cleanup rulemaking immediately we would start those efforts immediately after these go into effect to to work on some of to dig in deeper on some of these issues that have brought brought public comments and is your expectation that the second round the cleanup round also uh, You're speaking the mic. we're gonna shoot for that to be effective by September 1 2023 as well that would be a very aggressive timeline I, I can't promise that We'll, we'll meet that timeline, but we want it to be as soon as possible. Okay. So that second round is already there. Great point. Did you understand that, Commissioner, what she's saying? I did, but there again, uh, as you said, Commissioner, uh, we've already had this for about a year and a half, and now we're going into another year, and now you can't even promise 2023, and so now it's three years and nothing has really been done. That's just a statement. That statement. I mean. Okay. Any other comments? So we got a motion, we, Mr. Butler. I'll second that. We got a soaking second. Any further discussion? All right. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. All right. Nor. Oh, Commissioner Vessel. Okay. Well, won't you do a roll call vote, Christine? Yes, sir. Um, aye. All right. All right. Motion carries. All right. Derek, thank you. Thank you. Great job. Thank you, Derek. Yeoman's work. Appreciate your efforts on that. Thank you very much. All right. We're going to go to item O. Mr. Jennings. Thank you, Chairman, Commissioners. My name is Doug Jennings. I'm the Assistant General Counsel with the Department, and I have company, uh, <laughs> company this morning with Eric Beverly. Uh, director of our field, uh, field Inspections Division. 
Um, with your leave, Chairman, I'd like to consolidate items O through U into a single voting item. You have my leave. <laughs> uh, great, great. Thank you very much. Um, as you're aware, many of TDLR's programs require periodic inspections. Now, that means a licensed establishment or facility must be uh, inspected by rule or by statute every one or two years, depending on the program. Uh, House Bill 1560, TDLR's sunset bill from the last legislative session, uh, implemented a, a bit of a transition, uh, introducing Section 51.211 to TDLR's Chapter 51 of the Occupations Code. And that requires the department to conduct risk-based risk inspections and prioritize inspections based on key risk factors. <coughs> um, and so we have, well, it is, we have been under a periodic inspection model for a number of years, and we are transitioning into a risk-based uh, inspection model. And that's what these proposed rules, um, we, we, they will do. So we have seven, seven different items. We have what we, what we have before you is one set of uh, amendments to our Chapter 60 rules. And what those will do will create some new sections that implement the default procedures that are to be followed whenever we conduct an inspection. Things like uh, scheduling an inspection for <laughs> business hours of the establishment or how an inspector will provide uh, results of an inspection to, to the license holder in writing. Things like that. The number of other changes, the six other sets of changes in the various program <laughs> rules, what those changes will do will take periodic inspections out of those program rules and also remove a, a number of redundant provisions that, a uh, number of provisions that are now redundant after we will have created this new Chapter 60 rule. Um, and I wanted to have Eric, Mr. Beverly on hand to answer any questions you might have about um, what risk-based inspections look like compared to the periodic inspection model that we have. Um, so I'll just, we'll, I guess I'll just break if you have any questions. Any questions on that? So what you're saying, we're going to go into a scheduled situation uh, appointments rather than drop-ins? Well, we are, we're moving away from a periodic model. Now what we're going to have in terms of, we're not going to be scheduling inspections. <coughs> what the rules actually say is we may conduct inspections either with or, advan either with or without advance notice. And of course, uh, holding inspections without advance notice is a key tool in our, in our arsenal, if you will, to make sure that our, our, our regulated entities are, are, are following the law. So then what is the periodic Okay, so what we've had in the past and in a number of our programs, including the ones you see before you, driver education, vehicle storage facilities, bar costs, things like that, um, every one or two years on the calendar, we would send an inspector to that establishment. Now, it might not be on that exact date, but we would try to make sure that each establishment uh, is covered, is inspected once a year, once every two years, depending on what the statute or the rule says. Mm -hmm. And so what we're moving away, thanks to Section 51.211, we're moving toward a different model where um, uh, an establishment, for example, that has a pristine record may not be may not be uh, inspected once every calendar year. It may be once every two calendar years. Or what we're going to have our field inspections division is going to have a number of priorities, number of risk factors that they look at, including <coughs> number of previous violations by by a license holder, <coughs> the number of violations, the nature of violations, and that's going to determine. That's going to create the this ranking. flexible mm -hmm. framework so that some establishments who aren't following the law may be inspected more frequently than those those who are following the law and who have a good track record. And so that's, in essence, what the risk-based framework is about. Understood. Thank you. Well, um, and s go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to ask Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask you a question or two. Right? Yeah, absolutely. So um, w when you bring in Mr. Beverly, I know uh, it, it's, it's <laughs> you bring in beauty and brains in. <laughs> I'm not just saying that because we went to the same high school. <laughs> um, and that's that's why I'm on the board. We'll obviously. talk later. But um, so I, I think you touched a little bit on it, Doug uh, or Mr. Jennings. I just uh, what is your risk-based criteria? And so I just want to make sure that that's administered, you know, uh, objectively and in a fair way. So could you kind of delve into that a little bit? And and um, you know, this department um, uh, operates, you know, generally with just you know, great um, um, organizational skill and in a fair way, but I feel like I kind of need to address that a little bit, you know, and, and put out there on the record, what is um, an objective risk-based model um, going forward so that the people that we license can say, oh, they're not picking on me specifically, but um, there's some criteria that they're using. So could we touch on that just briefly? Absolutely. Uh, good morning. My name is Eric Beverly, Director of Field Inspections, Vice Chair Butler. Thank you for the question. Uh, we have developed a set of objective criteria that we use uh, for risk-based inspections. Some of those are set out in statute for us, 
uh, in the section that Doug mentioned, we are required to determine whether somebody has violated a law, rule, or order, and how many times they have done so. Um, the Sunset Commission and the legislature gave us the flexibility to also evaluate and add other factors that we consider relevant to risk. Uh, some of those include um, how folks did on their last inspection. So we're considering at the top uh, recidivism, right, and that's somebody who has been found to have violated a law, rule, or order of the commission multiple times in recent years. And they, those folks have gone all the way through the administrative hearings process and those violations have been upheld. Um, so that's the top criteria. And then we look at how they did on their last inspection. Did they have a clean inspection? There's no additional risk factor. Did they have lower level corrections and <coughs> violations that we don't send to the enforcement division but they're allowed to uh, make those? Then they have a slightly elevated risk. Uh, and then of course if they have direct to enforcement violations um, then uh, they have a higher risk factor. We're also evaluating when that business was last inspected, right? So the concern being that the further away in time we are from seeing that particular business, the more likely it is that they have come out of compliance. Those are the main criteria that we're using. If you get a, a, a lead from members of the public or something, does that elevate um, a particular company in, in, in your regard or your risk model? Is there a com component in there for Complaints would be routed through the enforcement division and they would have to be evaluated and acted upon by the enforcement division and if a violation was found then it certainly would filter into our, our risk matrix. But I think the question is just that by itself, I mean if just somebody that, just keeps yeah. going want to complain about somebody, that in and of itself isn't going to raise them up. That's right. The short answer if, is if enforcement ends up seeing that there's Yes sir, there are two outcomes from a complaint, right? Um, the complaint may be found to be non-jurisdictional or there's not enough evidence to proceed on the complaint, in which case it would be dismissed and it wouldn't impact um, our work. And then the, the other is that it, that complaint is found to have merit. It goes through the enforcement process. A violation is found. They exhaust all the administrative remedies they have available to them and then it's a violation and then uh, we could factor that in to their compliance history. Uh, any other questions, commissioners? All right, S seeing none, thank you, and thank you, Mr. Beverly. Yes, sir. Um, the, uh, just, just a little recap. <coughs> the proposed rules, all seven sets of rules, were published in the Texas Register on October 14th of this year. The department received 20 comments throughout the seven, uh, seven sets of amendments during the 30-day public comment period, which closed on November 28th. Um, and we are asking you to adopt all of the seven rule packets here with a Chapter 60, amendments as well as the individual program amendments um, as published with no changes with an effective date of January 15th of 2023. All right, great job consolidation. Any other comments, questions? I'm going to take a motion. I'll make a motion to accept items O through U uh, as written from effective January 15th of 2023. Okay, second? I'll second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, motion carried. Thank you, Commissioners. Great job. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. Thank you. Could we ever go back to those driving simulators? I loved those. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's the real thing. Okay, so I am going to uh, Mary. You're up. Item V. So this should be quick. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. We have one advisory board appointment for today, and that is for our licensed breeder advisory committee. It's for our presiding mm -hmm. officer. We have Mr. Joseph Levine of Burleson. He's been a member for about five years, and his record of attendance is 100% to all the meetings. He's a licensed breeder. Um, we vetted him. I threw it in front of the chairman's face last week, and he said, okay. So <laughs> now we're in front of you for a vote. But Mr. Levine is a very worthy candidate for a presiding officer. Thank you, Mayor. Any questions? 
I'll take a motion. I'll make a motion that we adopt the nomination of Mr. Joseph Levine for the Licensed Breeder Advisory Committee. Second. No, in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Come Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mary. And we'll double his pay. <laughs> <laughs> Go off, you doubled your pay too. Thanks. Okay, uh, we're gonna go back, commissioners. We have a. I'm gonna allow this. We're gonna have a uh, public commenter, right? Okay. Tommy, hey. Spell, say your name. Alcozer. 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 Okay. All right. I'm gonna read you some instructions real quick. Yes, sir. Okay. And then we're gonna go from there. Uh, we're going to take, uh, thank you for being here. Make sure you state your name. You have three minutes to speak. Please understand the commissioners are allowed to ask questions or engage in a discussion with you about anything that's not specific on our agenda. Please also understand that the commissioners cannot hear any information about a pending complaint or enforcement case because we may ultimately be a decision maker in the case. You understand? Yes, sir. Okay. You got three minutes. Go ahead and go. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you for taking my time today. I am uh, Tommy Alcazar. I am from Plainview, Texas. I've been a martial arts instructor since 1989. I teach lots of lots of different uh, martial arts in my school. We started out with karate, then we went into boxing, kickboxing, uh, went into MMA, and now we are in the process of doing pancreation, which is a form of MMA but for the youth. Uh, we've got lots and lots of regulations that we got for them. We, it's a very, very safe sport. We allow no head contact, no uh, face contact whatsoever. Lots of striking is involved, yes, to the body. They go to the ground and then they go to what we would call jiu-jitsu. Uh, we, we teach that in my school as well, just as well as wrestling. So that, when it hits the ground, we go into submissions. Uh, they, uh, they're just like the MMA. Once they do their arm bar or, or you know, or rear naked choke, we, we stop them. Our program is very, very safe. I've got some very good um, referees that um, I t took the time to teach to make sure that they were very aware of all the safeties for all of our kids, our youth. Our youth compete from the age of, well, actually from the age of five and up to uh, 17. And like I said, there is no face contact, no head contact whatsoever. Uh, we try to keep it as safe as possible. No, no, uh, no leg locks, no knee knocks, anything with joints is going to hurt them. Uh, if they go in for an arm bar, as soon as my referee sees that the arm is engaged into an arm bar, he stops it right away so that uh, they don't fulfill the whole arm bar uh, attempt to where try to keep in, once again, safety, safety for our kids. Um, this is just something that we've been doing out of state a lot. So I've been having to travel to uh, California, to Kansas, to Colorado. They're the ones that are allowing it. Uh, I was recently allowed to bring it into Louisiana. Um, uh, the commission there allowed me to start bringing pancreation there. So now I'm trying to bring it into Texas where that we can be holding it. I thought I had went through a, a few of the board members and, and got permission to do it, and I had gotten names and stuff, and I gave that to Mr. Alvarez just so he would know who was behind all of this. They had given me the old case. We started doing them, and then I received a phone call saying that uh, we didn't have the uh, permission to be doing these and that I needed to come before you. So that's what I'm here for. I'm here to ask for permission to continue on with this uh, into, into the state of Texas. Uh, where right now is 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 going big everywhere else, but here right now, um, just asking for permission to go ahead and start holding events like this. Uh, I do have medical staff on on line there at our events when we do them. Uh, it's no different than the karate tournament. Karate tournaments, there's no medical staff. Um, like I said, I've been in this for many years. Uh, there's nobody. Okay. Nobody there for the kids, you okay. know, as, as we do. Yes. We can't comment to you directly on yes, this, but I will yes. tell you what, before you leave, one of our staff members will make sure that you're given what you need to understand order yes, to proceed, okay? Yes, sir. So before you leave, we'll, we'll have a staff. Uh, <coughs> can we make sure we have staff follow up then? Okay? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you guys for your time. All right. Thank have you. Have a great Thank evening. You. day. Okay. Uh, we're on item W. Christine, are you ready? Yes, sir. Okay, either one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're fine. 
You have the floor. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. I'm Christina Kaiser, Senior Deputy Executive Director with TDLR. Um, I've been looking forward to this commission meeting for a while because I'm able to check boxes, check boxes, check boxes <laughs> on a lot of the sunset pieces that we have been working on for two and a half years. Um, so I, I applaud everyone who has put in the work that brought us to today. Um, and I just could not be more proud of, of everyone uh, on the staff, everyone from the industry who's had input, certainly the advisory board members and the commission for all of the input and the help that we've had. Um, in your materials for this meeting, I included two reports that we have recently turned in to oversight agencies to detail our progress on the sunset implementation to, 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 to date. Um, as you know, our staff re review by the Sunset Commission staff began way back in 2019. And after about a year, in June of 2020, they published their staff report about TDLR. And that contained um, a sequence of issues, and among, in, in a, each of those issues, they had recommendations for change. So when the Sunset Commission, the full commission, um, voted on TDLR's staff report, they adopted management action recommendations, and they also adopted statute change recommendations. And those two types of recommendations are the subject of those two reports that we have recently turned in. Um, the statute change recommendations became enacted into law through our sunset bill, um, HB 1560, that you've heard talked about many times today. Um, but the management action recommendations that were adopted by the commission we were still responsible for adopting those as well, even though they didn't go into the sunset bill. So the first report that we turned in was back in August, and it was to the state auditor's office. And they um, asked us to report on the status of our management actions, the non-statute pieces. And then just um, last month in November, the second report we turned in was about our progress on the statute change recommendations that became law in HB 1560. Um, I'm going to commend those to your reading. <coughs> They're quite lengthy. The second report on the statute change recommendations is 25 pages long, uh, just because of the amount of work that all of these people have done and many more people on staff who are not in this room right now. Uh, but I, uh, you can tell uh, by listening to me that I'm really proud. Um, it's been a humbling experience for me um, when, when Sunset um, started, I actually <coughs> went to Brian, the executive director at that time, and asked him to appoint me to be the lead on our implementation. And I'm so thankful that he did that. And I, I have to tell you, I expected along the way I was going to deal with complaining, with dragging of feet, with resistance. And I haven't seen any of that out of any of the staff. Everybody came as a soldier and did their part and they're still doing their part right now. So um, I just, I, I cannot say enough how proud I am of all of our folks. Um, one of those folks that I'm very proud of, I would like to uh, yield the floor at this time to Mr. Eric Beverly um, and ask him to give you a rundown on the e-inspections system. This is something that he built along with uh, certainly people on his staff and in conjunction with uh, people from Microsoft um, to be a tool for effectively implementing some of our um, sunset recommendations. Go ahead, Thank you. Privilege. Thank you, Christina. Good morning, Chairman, members of the Commission. Again, my name is Eric Beverly. It's great to be with you, Director of Field Inspections. I've got a PowerPoint presentation over here and behind, so hopefully you'll be able to see that. Uh, as Christine, Christina mentioned, I led a successful uh, information technology initiative uh, to develop an electronic inspection system that we call e-inspections. This is uh, in response to our sunset review, <coughs> and e-inspections allows us to digitize, standardize, and improve the efficiency of our inspections and improve data reliability and validity. E-inspections is a critical technological solution that will help us to implement Sunset Commission directives to, uh, to conduct risk-based inspections and to develop a comprehensive data-driven strategy for assessing program risks. So for many years, field inspectors completed handwritten proof of inspection forms, right, which uh, everybody has differing handwriting. 
uh, and they all used differing descriptions for the violations, right? So those were not standard. So, and then they would provide licensees with a carbon copy of the proof of inspection form. So the proof of inspection could be hard to read, and there were varying descriptions of the violations, making it difficult maybe for some licensees to come into compliance. Uh, additionally, inspectors would then go back and enter data into one of our many differing databases, and then they would have to re-enter some of that same data again for different reports that they would send to the Enforcement Division. So we were able, through the generous funding of the Texas Department of Information Resources, uh, begin this project. Uh, we worked with Microsoft, and I want to thank Daisy Wilk, who was the lead architect for Microsoft. Uh, incredible resource. Uh, it was really wonderful to work with her. The project cost was a, a little more than $571,000. Uh, it's important to note that this project started, uh, and you can go to the timeline, please. <coughs> Next slide, please. This project started as a proof of concept, and so a proof of concept is, um, and it was specific to the massage inspections and uh, trying to do something to address human trafficking. So a proof of concept means that there's no expected or anticipated deliverable, right, that you're going to actually put out into a production environment. So that's where we began. But then we were able to convert this opportunity so that we now have a production system where we can perform inspections. Uh, and pull data from multiple agency databases, three primary databases. So we began this project in mid-November. Uh, the original timeline ran through mid-April. We did extend the engagement a little bit um, and were able to fine-tune the system a little further and had a close out with Microsoft in early July. So the next slide shows uh, some of the features. So this now inspectors can use an iPhone or an iPad to enter violations data one time and they can then use that to create multiple products, including the proof of inspection report, which is emailed to the licensee, uh, direct to enforcement reports and complaints. Um, for each program, there is a standardized drop-down selection of violations that ensures the quality of the data. Uh, for we, uh, violations are categorized and connected to our direct to enforcement plan, so we're sending specific violations directly to enforcement, and that process is automated. Uh, and we're also connecting it to our enforcement plan so that the serious violations are front-loaded in our reports that we provide. Uh, photos can be attached, signatures can be taken. Uh, importantly, we automatically assign an inspection number and the date and time of the inspection that will help us to resolve an older SAO uh, audit finding related to health professions. Uh, one of the things that Sunset said we could do a better job of is looking at owner corrections. Right, what are people doing to fix these violations? And so we've built into e-inspections a feature for capturing owner corrections. They can now reply directly to the email that we send them, and they can upload documents and photos to prove that they have come into compliance, and then uh, inspectors can review those materials. That's awesome. Yeah, very exciting. Um, and then we can, of course, capture human trafficking information where applicable, and we can prioritize uh, the processing of that information. Importantly, this unifies collection of inspection data in one environment uh, and allows managers to easily assign and monitor inspections. So a few highlights. We, of course, had participation from multiple divisions within the agency, information technology, enforcement, uh, field inspections, and general counsel divisions primarily. We provided a number of training opportunities to inspectors, both in person and online. We uh, opened up and created more than 500 test inspections. And we went live on July 26th with our first inspection. <coughs> Since I did this presentation, at the time we had done 1,800 inspections. As of this morning, we've done more than 2,500 wow. using the system. Um, and we can do multiple inspection types. There's a note there that we were going to add midwifery inspections in December, and we did that in November. So, so these inspections. No, go ahead. Please. So these inspections are done at. Uh, places that we license? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And then the last slide I have, uh, Chairman, you had requested, um, and it may not be on this particular version, you had requested a time study. And so what we did is we completed a time study and a return on investment analysis. And so based on a total of investment of $571,505, the e-inspection system should pay for itself in 3.9 years. Um, it will achieve an annual savings of $147,000. That's a 
Yes. I'll be and um, I'm serious your bonus. <laughs> <laughs> so that concludes my report. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions. Really proud of you guys, and I'm, are all your check boxes? We're, we we have haven't checked all of them yet. But what's important to me, and what feels good about this moment, is we know the boxes that still need to be checked. They're in front of us, and we have a plan, and we know how to get there. Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Eric, this is this is wow. Good. And I Big. love the last slide. Great. Yeah. That, 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 that is everything. Yes, sir. It, it is not a. It, it brings home exactly the legislature and the governor's office what dollars we're bringing to the table <coughs> and the value added. So congratulations. Thanks, congratulations. Sir. congratulations. Can you all sleep a little bit better now? Oh, definitely. <laughs> yes. Excellent. Thank you. And I hand it back to Christina. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Eric. Thank you, Eric. Yes, ma'am. Great job. Really good job. One thing about that electronic inspection system that's exciting to me is up until this point, we have had data about inspections, results of inspections scattered out among multiple different databases, TULIP, Tools, Versa, depending on the program. So with the start of the e-inspection system now, going forward like a year from now or two, year for, two years from now, we'll have a good body of clean data about inspection results that we can use to continue to refine those decisions about risk. And aren't you um, having them automatic? I mean, time, your time is uh, as you get it. <coughs> oh, yeah. 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 It's, it's available in real time. I'll oh, ask Eric a question and he's time. like, mm -hmm. da, 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 and he's pulled it up. It's just real really time. impressive. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. That ROI is going to go up. Can you uh, so, come so to my house and tell me how to work my cable? <laughs> Changes, my yeah. I, I can't do that. I can't do that. So, uh, if, if we walk in uh, to one of our uh, licensed, uh, say it's a massage, uh, therapies or whatever, what happens then if we do find uh, someone? Do we report, call police? What, what is... If we do find uh, violations of our law, or Correct. what? Well, if we think she's about human trafficking. the human trafficking aspect of it, if the, if we do actually find that violation, <coughs> what happens next in regards to us? And do we call the police? Do we what? What is? Uh, and it's just for my sake, the curiosity in me. So I would be happy to ask Eric and or Mary to respond to that question. Um, I can tell you that there's not a one-size-fits-all answer. It kind of depends on the circumstances that are present in the facility at that moment. But our ultimate goal is definitely to put that, hands, put that information into the hands of law enforcement. Right, because, I mean, we're going through all of this, and then what? So if there is an emergent situation, of course. 911, of course. If it's a complaint situation, we have ATU, we have an email that you can present to us or send to us. We have numbers you can send to us. Um, in each of our licensed massage establishments, cosmetology, barbing establishments, they have the signs that are required by statute. Right. I've seen and that. so call that number to report it. So there are a number of ways that it gets back to us. Also, as Eric was saying in e-inspections, one of the things when we started even discussing this was the human trafficking element, and he just blew it up, right? So <laughs> it could be just like <coughs> way uh, more helpful and useful to the agency as a whole because we know that we find trafficking in various, actually, uh, professions <laughs> but uh, that we regulate. But as a whole, it's so effective to, as Christina said, to not have these things and reports done <laughs> in disparate <laughs> systems. And do you go in incognito or do you go in and present yourself? So as far as the anti-trafficking unit, we present ourselves as TDLR employees, members of the anti-trafficking unit. We go in, many times we co co collaborate with law enforcement, and we conduct an inspection. It's a specialized, highly selective inspection. Right. Um, but yeah, we, we're not incognito. The police do that kind of thing, but we do not. So by the time you get there, there's already some, you've already sniffed and there's... There is chatter. Yeah. There's chatter. There's a whole world uh, 
Commissioner Castaneda that I don't think you're aware of. I know I wasn't aware of it. Well, <laughs> so. yeah, and, I, and I'm sorry to burden no, no, the rest no, we, of we you all. Great questions. I know we're, we're, I want to yeah. close the meeting, but uh, we're going to take a two-minute break. Christine, right? That's fine. Two minutes ago, you need more of that. <laughs> Maybe five. Five minute break. So it's uh, nine or ten forty nine. Uh, commissioners, we're going to, I mean, and then we're just going to adjourn. So come back here five minutes, okay? <laughs>
of his retirement. Um, he will be retiring at the end of this month. I'd like to give you a little background about David. Um, David is a graduate of Texas A&M University. Uh, that's something we have in common. Uh, David and I were actually at uh, A&M at the same time, uh, but he graduated a couple of years after I did. Um, he was really having a good time. <laughs> David started work with TDLR on May 1st of 1996, um, and this touches my heart. David had recently reloc relocated from Houston to Austin for love. He came here to be with the woman who he ultimately married. Mm -hmm. um, our EAB program drew David's attention to TDLR uh, because it related to his studies in engineering and design. His first job at TDLR was as a project design assistant reviewing construction plans in our EAB program. And there he was working for the, the legendary legendary Rick Baduan. I don't know if there's anyone in the room who even remembers who that was. After a year, David was promoted to program administrator for EAB inspections and investigations. And in that role, he was responsible for resolution of all technical and logistical matters for EAB projects. And that's quite a breadth of responsibility for someone who's you know one year in the door. But he excelled in that, of course. Three years later, in 2000, he was promoted to program manager for the EAB program as a whole. And at that time, again, he was working under the legendary George Ferry. Um, in the years that followed, David enjoyed several more promotions, not surprising. In 2004, he was promoted to the Building and Mechanical Section Manager in RPM, the Regulatory Program Management Division. Um, and at that time, he was responsible for oversight of technical experts and program managers in multiple programs that relate to construction, uh, including architectural barriers, elevators, boilers, electricians, air conditioning and refrigeration <laughs> contractors, and industrialized housing and buildings. In 2013, he was promoted to a higher manager, manager position, still in RPM, in recognition of his performance, his valuable technical expertise, and his connection with the regulated in industries. In 2018, David was promoted to director of that division, RPM. And then, of course, in 2019, he was promoted to the deputy executive director position that he uh, still enjoys today. Um, David, you are one of the most knowledgeable, tenured, and accomplished people employed here at TDLR today. And it's with great respect and admiration that I extend my congratulations on your retirement. I hope your next chapter will be full of love, <coughs> full of adventure, and full of proud memories of your outstanding career here at TDLR. Thank you, Christine. My pleasure. I would like to yield the floor to Ray Pizarro, and then following Ray will be Dee Dee McEachern, who would like to make a few uh, remarks to David. Didn't say roast. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Chairman, morning. Uh, members of the board. Ray Pizarro, Director for the Education Examination Division. I just want to, first, David, um, I appreciate the time and effort you invested in, in our division, in E&E. &E. Uh, you have been a, a significant part of the division, and you'll be missed. Um, you've had a long, successful career. Uh, that's no small feat, but I, 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 I'm really been privileged in working with you. And the, the things, the, the ups and downs we've been through and, and, and the successes we've had, it's been really a, a, great, a great thing to remember. So I, I wish you the best. And uh, always know, you know, it, they always end up end these conversations as uh, you're going to come back and see us, right? You know, come back and see us. But now it's even easier because you're just a team's call away. <laughs> so that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but I wish you the best. Congratulations on your retirement. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. <coughs> I'm Dee Dee McKeecher, director of licensing for TDLR. And I have one of the few people here who can say they've been here since longer than David, uh, which means I've known him the whole time. Um, and what I want to let you know, David, I have worked with you from, gosh, being a, a someone I worked with in another division to being a coworker to being a peer, and now as, as, as a direct manager for me. And I want to let you know that I used to attribute your, several of your characteristics to being an Aggie. 
Hey, That's yeah. a good thing. But then I realized those are attributes of your character. And part of the things about being an Aggie, or is that politeness is always an Aggie trait. Uh, being very respectful, being very generous, being aware of other people's feelings. And um, for me, that's been the biggest takeaway from you is the humanness of connection and working with each other and supporting each other. And I really appreciate all that you've done for me and for the licensing and know how many people, um, not only here at TDLR, because you affected a lot of employees' lives at TDLR, but think of that bigger picture of the state. I know you'll never walk up a step into a building <laughs> without looking, because I can't anymore. You're never going to get on an elevator. It, all those things you've had a part in. And um, you'll know that for the rest of your life. And you're not getting away, because I know where you live. So, <laughs> thank you. But thank you, David. You've been great to work with. Thank you very much, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, I'm yielding the floor to you. All right, David. Uh, the, the, the risk reward was not high, so I'm going I'm to defer to your celebration when we have an opportunity to truly roast you in a very. Uh, That's fair. Event. So I mean, I'm sure everybody here. Um, I've said this about our agency many times, and the statement has been, "We're a quiet giant," right? Um, and the opportunity for us to serve the people of, of Texas and the citizens of Texas is a privilege, but it's a task. It is a, it's a task that is not to be dismayed or dis dissolved very quickly. It's a task that absorbs and consumes you. And I think that it really has a lot in people in the back of this row room, people on the side of this room, and people that are even aren't here. Uh, but the quiet giant is the personification of you as well. Uh, I think uh, that is, if, if there's one statement that holds true to your character and what I've learned from you, especially uh, to own the role of, of being a caretaker of one of the largest licensing, if not the largest licensing department in the United States, but here to own that role and to develop it, grow it, evolve it, and through COVID, snowstorms, Godzilla, King Kong fighting, I don't know what else is coming, but we'll figure it out. <laughs> There's going to be some kind of uh, craziness, but to own that, use your stalwart hand and support was was um, was known, respected, and appreciated on behalf of the commission. Um, you would probably be what I consider a TDLR nerd, by most parts. <laughs> Definitely, because you are you you breathe it. It is, is who you are. I've ridden the car with you, so I've had to <laughs> suffer the, 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 the conversation, and it was not so. But it, it, your passion <coughs> for the details and minutia associated with TDLR, and you're wanting to con make sure that each of this is looked at. Uh, is refreshing and inspirational. It makes me sleep better at night, knowing you're at the watch and uh, your coworkers as well at the watch. So thank you for what you do. Thank you for your tireless effort. Um, as you go into retirement, I pray we don't see you mowing your yard in black socks and, <laughs> and, 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 and you know complaining about how young and these youngsters are out every day. We don't want you to be that guy. Please don't be that. Or flip up sunglasses, okay? I'll send you pictures. There, there, will, there will be an intervention. I'm going to tell you there will be an intervention. So uh, let's not do the Griswold thing. But uh, well earned, well celebrated, and uh, I am excited about the season. Uh, the great good Lord has given you on this one, and so uh, the resources are at your disposal. You're always welcome to come back, always welcome to give us input if you need to, and uh, we'll tell you to go away if we need to as well. <laughs> three minutes. I got three, three minutes. Three minutes. <laughs> and uh, I, will be, I will be counting. So uh, on behalf of the commission and the, the department, we want to thank you. We want to give you a certificate as well. So if you don't mind, come on up. Come on up, come on up. In recognition of your tireless dedication to the citizens of Texas to the service of the law of the state that started over 26 years ago, May 1st, 1996, for advancing knowledge of agency programs, which has made you a reliable participant leader in each biennial TDLR strategic planning effort for your leadership and regulatory program management division director, where you help ensure the health, safety, and welfare of all Texas, for performing monitoring, review, audit, and inspection activities, for your oversight in the three divisions of TDLR for customer service, education, examination, and licensing, and deputy director. Executive Director, uh, we wish you luck in your next chapter of life. 
and it's got two famous people, Mike and I, signature. So <laughs> put that on your face. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Congratulations. Thank you. Good picture. 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 All right, David, why don't you go ahead and take the mic? You got, you got some, if you want to make some comments, you're welcome to make some comments. I'll keep it brief, sir. I'll make sure that happens. <laughs> Three minutes. David, David, um, could we ask you to um, pause for one moment? Sure. Carnesia has something she would oh, like to. Carnesia, go ahead. Thank you very much, Carnesia Pinson, TDLR. Um, we also have our TDLR gift that we wanted to present to you, David. In private. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's going to be very emotional, so we're going to get through this really quick. So if I could just take a quick moment to give you your gift. Okay. <clears throat> this is from the TDLR gift to you. If you want to share it with everybody, you can. Whatever you'd like. You but tell me. Totally up to you because the commissioners don't know what it is. Why don't you share? Show them really quick. That would be great. Thank you. Awesome. So everybody knows I've lost my hair at TLR, so I definitely need the cap. <laughs> That's beautiful. Well done. Beautiful. Fender Stratocaster signature SRV guitar replica. So I'm a guitar player, gu guitar collector, right. and I'm a collector of small guitars. This is the smallest that I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> see all this will be the smallest. So there's such a thing. Interesting. Tiny guitar. I am a golfer. Tiny uh, balls. Yeah. Move on. Move on. I'm Bill Murray style golfer though. So the, but the, I'll make use of those for sure. There. All right. I like this. It goes along with my Aggie 12th man flag. There you so go. What, what, into, what are you into? Everything little? <laughs> it's right size. It's not little. <laughs> it's right size. I'm with you, David. I'm compact for traveling purposes. <laughs> and a state of Texas mug. Awesome. Right. awesome. Thank you all very much. It's very thoughtful. <coughs> Definitely going to get used to these things. I will take some time just to go back to uh, Commissioner Butler, how you started the meeting with the prayer. We are here to serve. It has been my privilege and honor to be here, and it's the reason I've stayed, because everyone at this agency takes their job seriously. You said it earlier. This is hard work. It's a task. It takes its toll on us. But the people that I have here behind me, the mentors that we've had along the way, they've dedicated themselves to this agency. And we have, as you know, every two years, been given some responsibility and trusted with a lot of different programs. Some years we survive and that's what we just do we just survive because it's so overwhelming the work that we have to do the challenges whether they're IT related human resources related the resources that we may or may not be provided to get the job done our staff have been able to overcome all of those things but more often than not our agency has succeeded we've been given tasks that seem to be insurmountable and the people that are working alongside me and behind me have done extra things, come up with creative solutions, as just shared by Eric Beverly, whether it's the Bar Cause program taking that over, the Electricians program, which is a brand new thing to the state of Texas, or the Architectural Barriers program. Our staff have put themselves in the shoes of the people we serve, walked in their shoes, and tried to do the best that we can. We're not perfect. We may be coming back a few times to try to get it right, but we never stop trying. So I'm so proud and honored to be working for this agency again. I wouldn't be here for 26 years if it hadn't been that way. Thanks to Mr. Bill Koontz and Brian Francis for the vision that they had many years ago because I was here during a session where they actually proposed to abolish TDLR. So that was one of those survival years. But again, more often than not, we've succeeded. We've gained a reputation. The leadership from the commission the leadership that we currently have with Mike Adis Mendez and Christina Kaiser, we have that confidence. And we still have some work to do. I'm passing on the baton. 
definitely going to be cheering for those things that need to happen because I was hopeful that we'd have a new licensing system <laughs> before I retired, but it didn't happen. I'm hoping it's going to happen in my lifetime, and I think it will because we've got the right people in place. They've got some impetus. We've been talking about it for years. Dee Dee will see it happen. I know she'll see it through. Um, just so thankful that I've had so many mentors that have been gracious enough. And I want to recognize one more person, and this goes back to my start here. I shared with Christina Kaiser when I was filling out my application here, I wasn't really excited about the job to go work for the state. But my wife came here and I followed her, and I didn't have a job. I actually had to get three jobs to make ends meet for a little, ends meet for a little while. But I applied for this job at around 5 o'clock on the deadline of the date. I ended up getting that job. I didn't know what to expect. I started just around my birthday in May. Within a few months, my wife and I were expecting um, our second child, my, my second son. And Laura Montes was nice enough, kind enough to consider throwing me a shower. I'm getting choked up about it. She didn't have to do that. But it's that kind of personability, that kind of embrace, because I was new to the group. She didn't have to do it, but she did. It's the first shower I ever went to in my life. And I was really touched. She was just one of the first steps, one of the first cogs that showed me what this agency could do, and it made it easier for me to volunteer and participate. So just wanted to recognize her as well because she's still here as well, one of those few that has been here longer than me. And I'm just really proud to still know those people, to call them friends, and thankful that they were willing to uh, accept me into their group. That's all I had to share. Peter, Peter, thank you so much. And Peter. what now? Time with family is so important to me, always has been, but I have shared myself and my time with this agency. This I grew up with workaholic, <laughs> alcoholic parents, <laughs> I grew up with workaholic parents um, that dedicated themselves to their work, and I've done the same. I've had some good mentors that did the same, but I am not going to let myself um, wither at this office job. I'm going to ask for more days with my parents. I'm going to ask for more days with my kids, and now I'm going to be able to focus on those things. So that's my plan. That's I'm going to spend time with family, traveling with family while they're still able to, while I'm still able to, and um, yeah, I, ex I expect I'm going to be good at retirement, so we'll see. That's great. <laughs> Thank you so much for what you offered. Thank you for your comments. Your insight's always invaluable, and we appreciate you. Blessings and good luck to your new season. Thank you. Thank you for what y'all do, too. All right. Commissioners, we have a, a meeting on January 24th is the next meeting. Uh, I want to confirm before you leave, you get a chance to Christine, make sure she, she knows and we have everything else. Christine, is there anything else you have? No, sir. You sure? We can, uh, since Mike's not here, we can make fun of him. That'd be yeah. great. I know we do that. That oh, would take we don't too have long. enough time. That would take too long. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, all right, anything else, commissioners? No. Anything? All right, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second? Second. All, opposed, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Meeting adjourned.